Well, then let's uh, go into our program then. And I was thinking uh, lately, and again on the way over here, that I had wondered if uh, tonight's program might, you know, I think it's always relevant, but I thought, well, it might be slightly less relevant uh, than when I booked it because we were looking at this fiscal cliff, so called. And uh, as it turns out, we're, if the fiscal cliff is still there, um, however, even if it is resol quote resolved unquote uh, before the end of the year, uh, you know we may or may not probably not have a, a very favorable solution. So um, yes, I'm, I'm afraid to say that tonight's program is still as relevant, if not more so than ever, and it does relate to you know in the overarching sense protecting and preserving your assets. Um, and it's my firm belief that if it hasn't happened already, or happened in small ways at least, that when they run out of income to tax, they're going to have to just start taxing wealth, whether it's constitutional or not. And it's, it's coming. So you want to try to hold on to your assets and hold on to your wealth. And our speakers tonight are very well versed in this subject. and will give us a lot of interesting tips on how to do that. Uh, they've addressed us a couple of occasions before, and each time they brought new information because the environment is constantly changing and evolving or devolving, however you want to put it. So um, it's good to have people who are, you know, are on, the, on that beat and keeping an eye on what's going on, you know, on a, literally a day-to-day -day basis, I'm sure in preparing strategies for you. Um, some of the things they're going to talk about are basically defining trust, uh, trust operations, trustee responsibilities, how to structure trust, uh, establishing a business with a trust. So I think literally something for the whole family. And they're going to have some horror stories, I think. Uh, the one that was cited in our reminder and announcement uh, basically what the so-called death tax is going to do to family businesses and family farms if something isn't done and again as I say you know there may be a solution but whether it'll be you know an optimal solution that remains to be seen so we may have to develop some other strategies around you know around this eventuality so anyway um, I'm glad that um, Frank and Gwen are here tonight, uh, Frank Ozak and Gwen Wyckoff, so let me have them come up and I will hand the, the uh, dais over to them and please help me welcome them. Thank you. I first want to thank Mike and recognize Howard and and uh, George McCaleb, who is also a, a co-author of The Art of Casting the Buck, and uh, Bernie Brandt, Bernard Brandt, who helped us put our paperwork together for the DOJ. And if anybody has an interest in legal work, uh, both George and Bernard and Howard all have paralegals and they can help people put that stuff together. I want to thank uh, Mike for having us here, and I want to thank the Carl Hess Club, and one thing I did want to mention about this is that in our paperwork uh, from the DOJ, the Carl Hess Club was mentioned, uh, so therefore uh, you have stepped up and you have now become recognized by the, the New World Order. <laughs> And Eustace Mellon, <laughs> Eustace Mellon wrote about it in his book called The World Order, to where if you have any small club, no matter how small, you will probably have somebody there who is a representative of the order. They'll try to convince you to do something, they'll be very helpful. So Carl Hess Club has been recognized. And before we get, before we get started, uh, the... Uh, 
if people are watching this on YouTube, uh, there'll be a link here for any handouts that are given uh, below, and there's also a link on our website for it. Um, and one thing I would want to say is uh, if anybody's here that is uh, a, a member of an alphabet agency or res response to an alphabet agency, uh, please stand up and identify yourself. <laughs> Pardon? An alphabet agency. Alphabet agency. I belong oh. to the FIB. <laughs> okay, well, I don't see anybody standing up. I see a bunch of people looking around and some people looking straight ahead. So the people looking around, I guess, are trying to find out who, who, is, who belongs to an alphabet agency. And those who are looking straight ahead, you're suspect. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to turn this over to Gwen, and uh, she's going to carry the heavy load on this. And I hope you enjoy it. And and I want to a website address. Pardon? Give the website address. Oh, you can see us at, and this uh, video will be posted at uh, passingbucks. Dot com. And here's Gwen Wyckoff. And here I am. <laughs> Greetings and salutations. It's fun to be here. I hope to take you on a wild journey tonight and uh, make everything <clears throat> pretty exciting. First of all, I'm going to start by telling a story about our great Mike Everlin. Something he's totally forgotten. He was only seven years old when this happened. <laughs> he was in second grade. Maybe some of you have heard about him. The teacher came into class one day with a small envelope and inside the envelope was a cut up picture of the world. And these second um, graders were supposed to put together the world. Mike at that time, little Mikey, he was very fidgety. He didn't like sitting in class and all these pieces of paper of this silly world were not interesting to him. So he fooled around with them and he turned over a couple of them and he found out on the back there was a picture of a home. And he liked that, that was a neat puzzle. So he turned everything over because he was a rebel and he scotch taped it all together and he was done in 10 minutes and there he was with the world finished because when he put together the home the world took care of itself so that's what this lecture is about and of course we have to applaud mike for his brilliance <laughs> um, and the biggest conspiracy is the one against the family. You can put all the conspiracies together. You can list them, which I'm going to do tonight, a lot of them. And really, the bottom line is they're after you and your family. Humans cannot operate alone. They can only operate in groups. They need to share resources. They need to talk to each other. They're made of heart and soul. There's lots of entities on this planet, all dressed up in human bodies that don't have heart and soul. And it's unbelievable sometimes, uh, when we finally become aware of that, that we have to discriminate who we're dealing with. So my lecture is for heart and soul tonight. And I'm going to tell you a few more stories and then take you on a journey. This uh, empty jar here, I mean, it looks empty, looks about six inches with a white lid. This, this little jar here is not empty. There's something in here, and you're going to be able to see it later. Okay, um, I spent many years in transcendental meditation, listening to Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, and every once in a while he would say something that would just knock me over. It, it just took me forever to, to think about it. And he said, you can only love yourself. There's absolutely nobody that you can love but yourself. It's impossible to love another person. And the only, um, the only thing you love about another person is your own reflection. 
And <clears throat> I've gone through life for many years looking at that and recognizing that is so. And sometimes what you love in the other person is the other person's pain because it re reflects your own pain. But with this in mind, when we're talking about families, you have to understand that you have to have, in your group situation with your family, you have to have a situation where you get satisfaction, where you're getting your needs met. And in the system I'm going to show you and explain to you, it's all based on cross-vested interests and getting benefits. Let me just say a little bit about benefits. I've said it on the YouTube video a lot, and uh, I've said it on um, the audio uh, lecture that's on our website, but whoever gives you the benefits is where your loyalty belongs. And unfortunately, it's the federal government that's giving out the benefits, and that's where all the loyalty is going. And in this trust system, the common law trust system, we need to rewire our families so that the, the group power through the trust system is where you get your benefits and where you want to put your attention, which is on each other and on your family. The uh, families today are fractured. People are all over the place. There's dysfunctional relationships with parents and siblings and all kinds of stories about, you know, everybody's got uh, some issue going on with their family. However, the government has spent a lot of time programming the world to make sure that that is so. So at some place we have to stop and we have to decide where, how we're going to do it. And there is absolutely no organizational system, no leadership system that is available that is tight enough to hold the family together under the circumstances, except the common law trust system. And this is why it's been under siege. This is why the DOJ comes after people with trusts. This is, um, this is where the battle line is. So no matter what we um, deal with and how we look at it, the people that should support us, the people that we need to support us, are our family. Now, we may have to redefine family. We may have to say, well, my parents are, I can't deal with them. And you may have to get another group that's your family, but somehow you're gonna have to reformat your organization so that you can survive in whatever is coming. And I'm not a doomsday person. I don't say bad things are coming. I just say that if we can organize ourselves on a family basis and become strong, we can provide the leadership necessary. All right, yes? You will see on our newsletter, it says, inspired by family synergy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. Um, because we're in the trust business, I want to mention that all living trusts become irrevocable. And so there's a lot of principles about trusts in an irrevocable format that need to be learned before you do your simple little living trust that you can download off the internet. I'm not against doing that. I'm only against doing it without knowledge. In uh, volume one, we dedicate the whole uh, book to teaching people about inheritance, how to pass on her inheritance, what to do in every situation you can possibly imagine, whether the trust is irrevocable or not. But just remember, whatever you do, it will become irrevocable when the grantor dies. The subject of inheritance is probably the uh, one of the least understood in the whole world. And that's been deliberate. Deliberate. It's not a mistake. Why is that <laughs> Because they don't want you to. They don't want you to build your wealth from generation to generation. The powers that be, they have built their wealth since Rome. <laughs> they have always been in trust. They have always put everything in trust. They have taught every generation how to perpetual 
perpetuate the wealth and the people of Earth, the people that are not in those big families, those big ruling families, know nothing about it until we wrote these books. And now the whole system of how it's done is available. Uh, okay, I'm going to demonstrate. I'm going to demonstrate a system to create family cohesion. A strong family has a multitude of options. A strong family has multiple connections and because a formidable, becomes a formidable force in society by creating jobs. What would you rather do? Have to work from morning to night for somebody else or create jobs for somebody else? This is what family cohesion can do. Now I'm going to take you into the future because very few of you have ever experienced being in a trust family, in a trust situation. So we are going to go on a fantasy journey and we're going to go into the future and see what that looks like. And I brought my friend here in this jar and you can't see her yet because you haven't got your virtual reality glasses. And this jar really isn't six inches tall. This jar is really two feet tall. And inside this jar is the name of a being called Perpetual. And her last name is Wealth, right? And this is a fairy. And I'm gonna let her out of here. And she has purple iridescent wings. She has a teal dress. She has long, tawny hair down to her waist. I bet you can see her now. I can see her perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> and she's going to dust, gold dust all of you and give you your virtual reality glasses. And, um, and on the side of your virtual reality glasses is a dial. And it goes from zero to five. And you're going to turn it up to five. I'm taking the whole, all of you, and we're zooming into the future, and you're going to go three generations into the future. And in that future, you're going to be sitting in a beautiful room. You can design your own room. It can have an oval table, it can have a square table, it can have a mahogany table, but there's 15 people sitting at that table and you're zoomed into the future and you're sitting at the table. And what's happening in this table is it's, the, it's a, kind of like a board of trustees meeting. It's not a real serious one because it's not gonna have a big long agenda. But you are 30 years old, you're sitting at the table, you've been invited into this meeting, and the trustees are explaining how all the money is accumulated in the trust how the money comes in from the farm that was acquired through marriage by one of the beneficiaries, your aunt, brought the farm into the trust system. There's an electrical engineering company where the, uh, the, the trust is a partnership and it takes care of electrical engineering all over the world. And all this money is coming into the trust. There's a um, there's an apartment building with a hundred apartments to bringing in buco money, right? And you're sitting there at the table and you're looking at the pages of financial data and you are there because you are going to be trained how to help manage all this stuff. And when you were 18, see you're three generations into the future, and when you were 18, you met with the trustees and they said, you're going to get $1,000 a month and you're going to get it and you have five years to play with it. And what we want from you is we want you to have experience with money and we want you to have experience in life. You can either get an education or you get a technical education or you can just go out and have one job after another. And in five years, we want you to come back and tell us your experience. And then from that point forward, the trustees would design the rest of your training. So here you are in this board of trustees meeting, and they're telling you about the finances, and they're telling you they're gonna 
give you this management training situation so you can help manage the family finances. Now this is a three generation in the future. So while you're sitting there and you're thinking, wow, how, how did this all happen to me? You, the, the perpetual wealth fairy decides to take you all back in time to show you how it was set up. And so that's what we're gonna do today. We have a handout. We're gonna show you how to structure trust. A little bit of a structuring a trust, but we're not gonna do that quite yet. You have gotta get you back into this room. So you're gonna fly back into the room with the fairy. And you're gonna look down on the crowd and you're not sitting here. You're sitting here as your grandparents who set up the trust for the three generations in the future. And I needed to explain to you what the goal is and what the future looks like so you could possibly understand what we're going to do today. And the idea is to step you through a little tiny piece of how to set up a trust. This information comes from volume two, page 45, chapter 4. And the reason I want to tell you it's chapter 4 is because there's three chapters that go before what I'm going to tell you. So I'm going to only tell you a little piece because it's way too complicated to go any further. How much are those books? What? How much are those books? Oh, well, the little one is 40 bucks. And the big one, which isn't for everybody, <laughs> believe me, not. It's 500 bucks. And we keep it at 500 bucks because we want to keep the looky-loos out. If you're not serious about setting up a trust, we don't want you to get involved because it's very dangerous. I have never said it was easy to do what we're telling you to do. But if you are serious about setting up an organization to make your family work so you can sit in the board of trustees meeting in the future, <laughs> and wonder how all this happened, then you get volume two, okay? All right. So, previously, because I'm going to be jumping into a piece of trust structuring that's actually quite sophisticated, I want to just say that we're on YouTube. We have an hour and 15 minute video where we were interviewed about our court case. Uh, the DOJ came after us, and uh, we proved to them by law, we proved to them by example, we proved to them by every possible means you could that the trust system we set up is absolutely legitimate. And I think the moment in time when the uh, attorney for the DOJ got it <laughs> is when I said, why are you asking me all these questions? A common law trust is no different than a statutory trust. There's no difference in law. It's the same laws. Why are you doing this? And I, and I realized at that point that they actually thought a common law trust was a different animal. It's only a different animal in the sense that it is more sophisticated and it's harder to manage, but it has so much more potential. But if you have a, a court case and you're going to fight about it, your trust in, in front of a judge, it's, it's the same laws as a statutory trust. So I was like, okay. So at that point is, I think, where the whole thing began to turn around. And they began to realize, you know, we weren't doing anything illegal or these were not sham trusts. The biggest difference between a sham trust and a real trust is whether you have two real trustees. Trustees are essential because they're the ones who have their name on the checking account. They're the ones who own all the investments. They're the ones who administer to the beneficiaries. And they are separate entities. Your name is not on the checking account. And you have to trust these trustees, that's why it's called a trust, to take care of you. And there's the trick. It's quite tricky. You better know what you're doing. Okay, we also have an audio lecture where I take you through the details of that particular 
uh, scenario where what do trustees do and what do all the officers do and all of that. So you can get all that on in other places. Okay, like I mentioned, the family is the only target. No matter what kind of conspiracy you go to, <laughs> at the bottom, the um, family is the target. I call it yo-yo banking. The banking system on this planet can be um, manipulated anyway at any time by anybody who's got the power. And these are these big ba uh, banking families that can do this. Now you may not understand the, the issue of poverty in reference to politics. Poverty is the deliberately set up by the powers that be because this is where they get their armies. Drugs and gangs is a beautiful source for armies and assassins. And, it's a, and they're funded by the alphabet agencies. These are all against the family. They release felons from prison early to terrorize the population to make sure you cannot get feel safe. They do not want you to feel safe. And of course, we all know about pedophiles. All over the place, pedophiles. I brought one article that was on the internet. It's called Rampant Child Porn Rings at Government Agencies. Your fiends, these non-heart and soul people, they get fed children for payment. A pedophile is an obsessed creature. If you want him to go murder somebody for you, he will promise him five, five little girls. It's ugly. It's very ugly. But again, it's the family being targeted. You're up against a huge, huge enemy. And they've been at it a really long time. So you're now, remember, you had come back from the future, and you're wondering how your trust got set up. And so you're in this lecture right now, and you're understanding that it's very dark. When your grandparents set up this trust system, it was a very, very dark time. And what happened from the time your grandparents set up the trust system is they gathered enough momentum and enough internal fortitude by long-range planning, that they were able to do something to clean up some of the problems that we have now. And it would take a lot of people to do this. And I didn't say I was dealing with reality. <laughs> I, I said it was a fantasy. But we at Charles Arthur, this is what we're about. We're about educating people how to set up their family so that they have the cross-vesting, they have the benefits they hold together. The military domination of the world is about making sure that oil remains in, in um, the backing of the dollar. These are called petrodollars that we have. Your one dollar bill in your pocket is backed by oil. So if you change the oil domination of the world, then you're going to change the financial situation in the world. And this is where the great big power uh, houses are fighting. Of course, we all know about dumbing down the population through the education system, or don't we? <laughs> you know, you learn algebra in the morning, and you learn chemistry in the afternoon, <coughs> and the two are not connected. That's what happened to me. I was brilliant in, in algebra, but could I ever apply it? To chemistry? No, <laughs> I can't. It's compartmentalized learning, and it's done deliberately. And the educational system is about making sure that people cannot rise too far. They want factory workers. The government is very, very into programming the population. So the people better get onto programming their own children. What is kind of upsetting today is the mother with the baby and the stroller 
and she's got two earplugs in her ears, and she's texting while she's listening to some music. Is she paying any attention to the baby? Uh-uh. I'm sure all of us have seen this. Consciousness is transmitted by eye contact. You have to do your Gucci Gucci Goos, and you have to do your peekaboos with your baby, and you have to talk to your baby. Your baby is your future. In the common law trust. What? Touching. Huh? Touching. Oh, touching, touching, holding, all of that. Um, in the common law trust system, you begin to realize your children are your product. Your children are your asset. The focus goes away from trying to buy the speedboat into making sure the children rise up to take care of the future. Um, okay, where are we? Okay, you know about those situations. You probably had it in your own family if your parents were going to leave you anything at all. Where your mother or your father would not tell you anything about the money that they were going to pass to you. They absolutely refused. They were so afraid that you wanted to take their money that they never told you anything, then they die, and nobody's prepared for what happens. That's, that's happened with my father. He, he, had, he had a substantial sum of money, and he wouldn't tell me anything, then he died, and his brother took over the trust my father set up. And his brother took him months to figure out where all the money was. <laughs> you know, and there was no instructions. There was a trust, but there wasn't any instructions where any of the wealth was. When we set up an irrevocable trust, all that money gets transferred to the trustees, and you turn your family into a business, and the trustees print out some financial reports, and the beneficiaries get to see what's going on. It's full disclosure, and it's full participation in the family. And the family comes together, and this is where you start getting your, your beneficial uh, distribution and your vested interest. This is where it starts. Not this uh, closed-lipped kind of thing that parents often do. When I give you your little assignment here, you're going to see uh, three trusts, four trusts, and you might wonder why there's four different trusts. There's a, there's a thing in the trust world called asset separation. That's if one asset gets seized, you don't lose all the others. In our um, uh, uh, video, we tell a funny story about that. It's called the dog bit. The, the dog was in trust. <laughs> the dog bit somebody. The person sued, and he ended up with the dog in the trust. <laughs> That's all he got. He didn't get the house or the car or anything. I can give you a, a more classic example. The Kennedy Trust. Uh, all of the property is in the Kennedy Trust for, for, for this entire family. When um, oh, the, the, the Kopechny family uh, attempted to sue um, old, um, old Edward Kennedy, they found that he did not own the, the house that was over his head. He did, he did not even own the, the car that killed their daughter. If they could sue him all they wanted to, but there was nothing for them, or, uh, no, nothing that, that they could take back. That's what a family trust can do. And it saved his bacon. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't want to, you know, go over things that we already have in public domain because I want to move on here in reference. I uh, thank you for that, Bernie. Uh, I, I want to reiterate, uh, since Bernie just contributed to this, I want to reiterate what, how brilliant he was with his paperwork in reference to saving us when the DOJ came after us. We can highly recommend him as a great researcher, and he can understand. He understands uh, strategy. Okay. Yes. Just to put that in perspective. The DOJ had gone into court 99 times before that for prior restraint on publications. They were 99 and zero. 
they came after us and with Bernie, they walked out with the the paperwork, the paperwork they sent against us caused uh, George and Bernie to go into great, hilarious laughter. <laughs> it was so bizarre and off the wall. <laughs> and uh, Bernie was uh, quite incensed with the injustice of the situation, and so he jumped in and helped us. And George was a great part of allowing that to happen. So. Just because it was humorous and off the wall doesn't mean it wasn't deadly serious. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. It was scary. I mean, since it was my name and Frank's name, I, I didn't find it funny. <laughs> I'm glad they did. I also plan on writing a book about the whole affair and of telling as well the skill sets and the knowledge set that one needs to fight. But I'm in fact, the working title for it is How to Defend Yourself Against Government Bulls. Because that is precisely what it happened. Okay. Are you ready to, to uh, structure your trust, grandparents? Did, it, did you guys pass out the little thing, the flyer already? Okay. Now, I realized when I when I decided to put this together that it was probably way out of sequence and way ahead of the game. But I figured if you're if you sit down and you actually have to name some, your own trust, <laughs> it might sink in a little different, uh, a little deeper. So I want you to go to Exhibit A, the one that you don't have to fill out. And this is called, this is straight from the book, it's called the Alan J. Family Trust. And in volume two, we take you through the whole setup of this trust from beginning to end. We take you through all the details. And uh, the reason that trustee names are a little odd is because then you'll remember them. And so the Alan J. Family Trust is the last names of the mother's maiden name of both the grandparents of the husband and the wife. So the husband's mother's maiden name was Alan and the wife's mother's maiden name was Jay. And the reason we use the maiden name is because it divorces the, the uh, government agencies from connecting you in current time to the trust name. It, it causes a separation because you don't want to name your trust after your current surname because then you're targeted, all right? The other reason that we use this <coughs> is these two people, Al and Jay on here, have a history. And the little kids are gonna say, well, who are these people? And then you get to tell your children the history, okay? So it's a really big family deal. So when you're gonna name your own trust, I want you to think about a name that is disconnected from your surname and that will give your family a history. The trustees on this particular trust are chosen because they are friends and they're trusted and all of that choosing of those these two trustees is taken is, is written up in the books in both books. We think choosing trustees are is, is a very big deal. Okay. You don't choose trustees lightly, and you better know what you're doing, and they better know what they're doing. And then we listed the assets that are going to go in what's called the management trust. The management trust handles things to where it's not interactive with the world. It, it handles passive investments. It handles those big checks that come in every week, and, it can, and the management trust disperses it. To, the, to all the beneficiaries. And the beneficiaries are named on this particular Exhibit A because this page comes out of the, trust, uh, comes out of the book. We're not gonna go into, in this meeting, how to choose your beneficiaries and TCUs. That is a huge subject. Takes the whole book <laughs> to explain it. Um, but it's on this page because you want to, I wanted you to see what beneficiaries look like and notice that they are different on different trusts. That's very important. 
What does TCU stand for? Trust Capital Unit. It's your piece of the action. When you get born, you have a TCU when you get born. You have probably 10, okay? So you're already rich, even though you're one day old. <laughs> so you're always, you, you come into the world with a vested interest in the trust. And the trust, at the very least, should, in an ideal situation, handle your food, clothing, and shelter. In some way, it should guarantee that you'll never be on the street. When you can build up the assets that much. Okay, so the management trust is handling the mutual funds and some cash and some stock account and a promissory note, that kind of thing. And then <clears throat> the uh, settlers or the people who are setting up the trust are not listed on here. They had a brother who had a, uh, what kind of, sh it's a machine, uh, Jones Energy Partnership. IBM stocks and, and the brother wanted to come into the trust system system, but he didn't want to mix his stuff up with everybody else So he's doing a business trust and He also has a partnership So he comes in as a business trust and he names his beneficiaries Then you have two asset holding trusts asset holding trusts do not interact at all with the public they hold assets. These are, you know, things that are just sitting there. And that would be residential property in the Dawson Trust. And S.M. Myers Trust has all the equipment. And this management trust is the one that manages all these assets. It manages and it distributes and all of this. The business trust has its own checking account. It does business but the Allen J. Family Trust manages the business trust. You got all that? It's clear? Are you looking at your, your diagram? <laughs> okay. Now, what you're going to do, because you're the grandparents here and you're setting up this great big trust, you're going to at least take a, a little tiny step and turn this over, and you're going to name your management trust you're going to name your business trust, you're going to name your two asset holding trust, and you're going to put in the business trust what kind of business it is. And in your asset holding trust, you're going to put in there what kind of assets they are. Okay? Go! <laughs> right! <laughs> you may want to think, who you want for your trustees? You have to be close friends. Oh, wait, your trustee, one of your trustees, is the person across from you or the person to your right? And write that person's name. I have trustees that I want to use. Can I put the name? What? I have trustees that I want to use. Yeah, put them in. Uh, you cannot name George or myself as a trustee because we're forbidden by law for being a trustee. <laughs> oh, you're available again. Okay. Yes. <laughs> you can be a trustee, George? Okay, get your name in. You guys all got your name? Fictitionally, you can. For this exercise. Has everybody got their name in? Name of the trust. Name? It's fun, isn't it? You see, just naming your trust takes a tremendous amount of energy. Mother's maiden name would be a good one. Grandparents, their name. There's somebody who meant, meant something important to you in your life. Some a, a name that you want to like you want your children to know about. Uh, a trust that I inherited from a long time ago was set up in about 1920, and it was named named after the guy who set it up. And I, I was always wondering, what did he do? And I was always asking people to tell me stories about him. And unfortunately, my family wasn't too, didn't have a lot of information about him. But in 1920, I understand the trust was worth $400,000. In 1920. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
It was a lot of money. But how much was it worth after 29? Well, we had a member of our family, one of those heartless demon things, and it, he spent lots of his own money trying to break the trust. So it depleted the assets. So, all right, you all got that? How about you got your trustees in? Yeah. How about your asset, asset for the business trust? You got that? The assets in your business trust. It's going to have a checking account, so it's a business. It's going to be dealing with the public. Linda's not playing. What? Oh, <laughs> he filled it out already. <laughs> and uh, what do we have in our asset holding trust? Got to get names for them. And uh, what kind of goodies? Well, Bernie, what kind of goodies do you have in your asset trust? Oh, well, they make money, so they, they got to go into the management trust. The inert assets, the non action asset. The thing that just sits there like that. Precious metals? Uh, precious metals. Where would you put the, that? You 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 cash them in and you you have a check you have a cash flow with that. That's a management trust. Okay. Hard work. Hard work. Hard work is a business trust. <laughs> what kind of asset do you have, Mr. McCallop? Only one of them. I have homes. You have a one home or two more. One home. All right. What do you have in the other one? I have artwork. I <laughs> know. <laughs> and antiques. Huh? Artwork and antiques. Antiques. Oh, hardwood, did you say? Artwork. Oh, artwork. Okay, artwork and antiques. That's good. Okay. How about Athena? Uh, what? The asset. Yeah, we're looking for the uh, asset that just it doesn't produce cash or anything; it just sits yeah. there. Um, yeah, cars okay. A car goes into that. Gold and silver. Yeah, we like to put gold and silver in the management trust because you can cash it out. Okay. It's a lot of cash flow that goes with it. Cash flow. So you got a car and a home. That's good. Oh wait, you know this is virtual reality. You know you got your got your little virtual. You put put stuff in there. Put the Bentley in there. Yeah, put the rolls in there. I wanted to own property because I never really owned it. Stick it if you want to own it. Stick it on there. I don't give the government the money they want. They take it from me. So I don't know. But you're not going to own it. It's going to be under the name of the trustees, so they'll never know. The trust has to pay the taxes. But then, you know, because the government doesn't get the money they want, they take stuff. That's what I've noticed. If, if it's yours. Well, I'm having a problem here dealing with the machine business. <laughs> the machine? The machine tools are in one trust and the business is in another. How do you go about transferring depreciation from the machine to the business? <laughs> uh, um, that's an accounting thing. Um, we keep the... Uh, the tools are separate by ownership, but you. But it's in a separate trust. So if you want to appreciate it or depreciate it or whatever you want to do, it's it's in another. So you've got money passive back. Well, you're you're renting out that equipment, all right. So the money passing back and forth is going into the business trust. The actual physical ownership is in the asset trust. And how you you would work for the management trust, and you would have the problem of the appreciation, the depreciation issues, and the schedules and stuff. But if the actual ownership is in that box, okay, and and the box is owned by the beneficiaries, so you can rent out the equipment in the asset holding trust. 
and, and the money goes into the business trust. Does that make sense? Good. She's an accountant. <laughs> Breathe. <laughs> All right. Who else is going to tell me what they got in their asset holding trust? Yes. I have the books that I've written and the uh, recordings that I've created of the therapy and uh, my whole seven key turnkey system for the therapist to build a practice. As long as it's inert and not moving? Yeah, that's right. Manuscripts are good. What? Yeah, but but the the physical the physical manuscript is in an asset holding trust. It's generating money through the uh, business, business trust. The copyrights, what we're talking about, are never in the business trust. Copyright is is um, in a, well. So in, artwork would be just sits there, right? The artwork just sits there. Now, if you make copies of the artwork and you sell them, you sell them to your business trust. But the originals can be in a asset holding trust. So, when so the trustees will go into the asset holding trust and sell the originals someday, and then the beneficiaries of that asset holding trust get the distribution. Did you follow that? Linda's fo Linda followed that. <laughs> yeah. Did you have a question? Oh no, I was just kidding. Okay. All right. Did you have a question? Yeah, I wanted to know what you do with copyrights and patents. I didn't quite hear it. We're going to business trust. No, the actual physical manuscript and copyright and all that goes into an asset holding trust because it's dead. It's it's not moving. It's but not a moving thing. Would come back into the business. Yeah, but yeah, the royalties and all that come back into the business. So trust. the intellectual property actually stays in the business trust and collects the royalties. No. No, no the, because you have a contract between the uh, holding trust and the business trust to collect the royalties. Yeah, see the beneficiaries own what's in the asset holding trust. You have to understand who really who really gets the benefit. The benefit is the beneficiaries. Alright? So if you if you have something in an asset holding trust and you sell it, then the beneficiaries get it. Get the money. But if you have it in the, but the business trust has a contract to manage the asset in the in the asset holding trust. So through that contract, the business trust administers all that money. Let's say you have a Monet, and it's in the asset holding trust. Okay, if you sell the Monet, then the beneficiaries get get it. All right. Now let's say you're going to make. What do you call them? Glichés? Is that what it is? Copies of she the was. artwork? What is it? She plays. Whatever it is. <laughs> Pardon me, you can all laugh at me. But uh, if you make copies of those things, you sell them through the uh, business trust. But the original is in the asset trust. Let's say that you had four or five pieces of real estate investment properties, apartment buildings or like Those are going to the asset trust? Yeah, the actual building is in the asset trust. And then the businesses that actually... C gathers the money is the business trust. Okay, so if there's an LLC that's set up that actually owned them, would you then take out the LLC and put it into the asset trust and keep the LLC as the business? As part of the business trust? Now you're mixing apples and oranges <laughs> because the LLC have, is a different they entity. Control over an LLC. They don't have any control over a trust. So you take everything out of the LLC and just drop it out of the trust. Right. Because I'll be able to see. They can ask you for your paperwork anytime they want to on an LLC. They cannot on a trust. But you will not. Except under certain circumstances. Yes. Which Bernie judge. taught us. Mm -hmm. No, well, when you're in discovery, the uh, DOJ, the attorney for the DOJ, can just write something and demand to see something. It's not under the Fourth Amendment for some reason. Bernie could probably do a whole speech on that. <laughs> but if uh, that's going to be a part of at least one chapter of the book. At least. All right. But anyhow, they didn't get anything anyway, so there was nothing to get. 
Okay, any other questions? You, you guys got your trust name? You got your assets stuck in your little asset trust? You got your business trust straightened out? And the management trust is where Linda would work, and she handles all the accounting for the business trust and the asset holding trust. <laughs> and uh, Bernie works for the management trust as a legal uh, researcher. And then you have an executive secretary and you have a general manager and they work for the management holding trust. No, not the management trust. And uh, they administered all the other trusts. Ownership is determined by the beneficiaries on the trust. And that's how it's kept separate. Any questions? You all got your uh, foot, foot into the door for your setting up the three generation trust you saw in the future? <laughs> and let's hope. Any, any last questions? Because that's it, I think. Let me see, do I have anything else here? The paperwork is done by the executive secretary, signed by board of trustees. And how you get money into the trust is called loading the power and it's explained in volume two. So you have to set up the structure, you have to get, there's a separate trust book for every trust, there's a separate trust capital unit register for every trust, they're all kept separate. And how you get money into each of the trusts and how you transfer everything into each of the trusts, all those details, how you do it is in volume two. Volume one, volume one covers the basics on trust, and even though you are getting another, you're involved with another trust, uh, you still, the grantor of the trust still retains powers that are uh, approved by the Internal Revenue Service to where you can still control the corpus and the income. The grantor still has the right to determine what is corpus and what is income and it's legal and it is in the IRS code. We don't talk about taxes, but that's what's in there. I can that's verbatim from right from the code. So uh can't tell you what to do about that, but it's uh the grantor still retains powers that he can uh, exercise while he's still alive. And if you are setting up a trust, um, the trustees need to be very sure what powers they allow the grantor to have. I mean, he's setting up the trust, he can retain powers he wants to, but uh, the trustees need to be clear about what that means and whether they agree with it or not. And uh, we have the footnotes to all that in volume one. You don't have to get volume two to find that out. Okay? That's it. Yay!